Let's begin with prayer. Holy God, you sent Jesus to be the good shepherd of us, your sheep. Thank you that through Jesus you provide all that we need. He makes us stop and lie down and rest. And in Jesus, you lead us to the water of life and you restore our souls. May we never forget that we can't live without you, your son, Jesus, the water of life and your Holy Spirit. We give you praise and thanks for us being your sheep and Jesus being our shepherd. We come here this morning to adore you, to delight in you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down before him, shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Our opening hymn of praise is 238, Thine is the Glory. and prayer of confession. Glorious ancient one, we confess our tendency to be caught up 
and worries and concerns, forgetting that you are aware of all anxieties. May we be awakened to new life, serving in Jesus eternal of the kingdom today. Amen. Whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and receive the Holy Spirit to serve in the kingdom of God. God, we give you thanks for Jesus, who is our friend, Savior, and your word to us. Lord Jesus, we await the help of your spirit so we would hear and respond to you today. Amen. The scripture lesson is Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows 
of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always per persevere in supplication for all the saints. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture for this morning is Daniel 7. Listen for God's word. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. And then he wrote down the dreams. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. The first one was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And then, as I watched, its wings were plucked off and was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being, and a human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It raised up on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. After this, as I watched, another appeared like a leopard, the beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking into pieces, and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that had preceded it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up among them. To make room for it, three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. There were eyes like human eyes on this horn and a mouth speaking arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set in place. The ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. And as I watched, the beast was put to death, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming from the clouds of heaven, and he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was troubled within me, and the visions of my head terrified me. I approached one of the attendants to ask him the truth concerning all this. So he said that he would disclose to me the interpretation of the matter. As for these four great beasts, four kings shall arise out of the earth, but the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. Well, then I desired to know the truth concerning the fourth beast, beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying, with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet, and concerning the ten horns that were on its head, and concerning the other horn, which came up, and to make room for that which the three of them fell out. The horn had the eyes and a mouth that spoke arrogantly, and that seemed greater than the others. As I looked, this horn made war with the holy ones and was prevailing over them until the ancient one came. And then judgment was given for the holy ones of the Most High. And the time arrived when the holy ones gained possession of the kingdom. This is what he said. As for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth that shall be different from all other kingdoms. It shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. As for the ten horns... Out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. 
This one shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, shall wear out the holy ones of the Most High, and shall attempt to change the sacred seasons and the law. And they shall be given into his power for a time, two times, and a half time. Then the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and totally destroyed. The kingship and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the holy ones of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey them. Here the account ends. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly terrified me, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter in my mind. Amen. Well, as we read this account from the book of Daniel, we realize it doesn't quite fall into the right order because this took place in the first year of Belshazzar's reign. So if we kind of try and look at the timeline, we find that this dream and visions occurred before chapter 5. For that was where, that's the chapter where Belshazzar died at the close of the chapter. So, obviously, the book of Daniel is not in chronological order as in when things happen, but seems to be put together by the nature of the activity going on in Daniel's life. Some think that this chapter is more similar to the rest of Daniel, and that's why it is placed as it is. So while Belshazzar was ruling and ignoring Daniel's presence or existence, Daniel was experiencing his own terror-invoking dream and visions that we just heard about. One description of this passage, this particular chapter, is that it's apocalyptic. I know that's your favorite word in um, those religious words that we have. So Dale Davis gives us a wonderful definition, and I'd like to offer that today. A biblical apocalyptic writing is a sort of prophecy that seeks to enlighten and encourage a people despised and cast off by the world with a vision of God who will come to impose his kingdom on the wreckage and rebellion of human history. I love that line, the wreckage and rebellion of human history. That just describes so much of what has happened in our world sometimes. And communicates this message through the use of wild, scary, imaginative, bizarre, and head-scratching imagery. End of quote. Well, one aspect of this apocalyptic story is dominion. You could pick many things, but I decided dominion is what struck out, stuck out to me this time. Who are these that have dominion, and who has the ultimate dominion, as the children and I talked about? The Aramaic word shultan, translated sovereignty or dominion, occurs seven times in chapter 7. It's very biblical, and that is why I chose that word. We may remember that dominion occurs other places in Scripture. If you think way back to the beginning of Genesis, God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the fish, the beasts, the birds, and all that creeps along the ground. This dominion was given so that they could rule over these or manage them. Adam and Eve were made in God's image, and the image of the one who created now offers them to share in that dominion with them over this beautiful world that God had created. Now, God had given them everything, and God wanted them to be fruitful and to multiply in order to care for this wonderful world. But if we keep reading in Genesis, we find that Adam and Eve refused God's dominion and listened instead to the snake who began to talk to them, and they gave the snake dominion over them. The outcome, I don't think it was anything they could have imagined. They were escorted out of the garden. And I would say that we've been struggling against the dominion of the snake ever since. But in our dream, the dream that we were just hearing about that Daniel has, God shows Daniel these beasts, some other beasts. They aren't snakes. These are some pretty scary beasts who actually represent kings and dominions and battles and things that will happen. Daniel isn't satisfied with just that initial glimpse. He he is seeking the truth. He wants to know more about these terrifying beasts that are, were in his dream. And so do you notice Daniel kind of steps into his dream. He asks the attendant in that dream to share 
about what's going on, and the attendant agrees. And so he shows him that fourth beast and the fourth kingdom and describes the devastation that will result after the ten kings and another king that comes after them, who goes after the Most High even, and the Holy Ones. And it even takes on the law and the sacred seasons. And Scripture says that one succeeds for some length of time. Thankfully, God also shows Dan Daniel two times in his dream that court that he set up, the, the, the thrones that were set in judgment over those who may have won or gained dominion over everything. It seems like even over God for a time. No wonder Daniel was scared by this dream. These scary visions and all their apocalyptic, apocalyptic mystery can distract us. And we get lost in trying to figure out, now, which king was that? Was that Nebuchadnezzar? Was that Cyrus? Was that Rome or someone else? I hope today that we can look beyond trying to put names with faces to see which king or kingdom is which and instead help that let this dream and the vision enlighten our minds and our view of our world that we live in today. The ancient one, of course, represents God who took his throne and the king then is going to rule. But first the king opens up the books. Now, that might seem a little frightening to think about that everything is written in a book somewhere. You think about that and you think about your life. It gives, gives, makes me a little nervous. That might seem um, also very wonderful because God keeps record so that these beastly kings can be found out and punished. The worst beast of them all is destroyed and the rest have their dominion taken away. But God has mercy and lets them keep their lives. It's interesting. Then the one like the human being or the son of man, as it says in some translation, comes down from the clouds and is presented before God. We found out that he's given the dominion and the glory and the kingship and all the kingdoms and the nations and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall never pass away and his kingship can never be destroyed, even when it looks otherwise. Now, God is my favorite kind of storyteller because God gives Daniel the ending right after the beginning. I just love that. You don't have to read to the end of the story. God tells, it starts the beginning and then he tells the ending and then he goes back and tells him the rest of the story. He gets the good news first. But how puzzling and troubling this must have been for Daniel. Many commentary, commentary writers and Daniel probably wouldn't like that either, debate whether this portion of Scripture is actually pointing to Jesus, that one that's called the Son of Man. Lots of debate on that. But I have to agree with um, Dale Davis because I believe it's pointing to the Son of Man because when we read in Scripture, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And, and when we read the last part of Matthew and he's on trial himself, it's very interesting, Jesus says, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated on the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. It seems to me that comes right out of Daniel 7, 13. But if this scene is not enough, God goes on and shows Daniel some more of the details of the ones that will devour the whole earth and even be given power over the holy ones and, and, and be given the ability to corrupt the sacred seasons and the law but not forever, only for a certain amount of time. Then God again shows Daniel the court of judgment and the dominion taken away from that one who is out to destroy. And in the closing scene, the, king, closing scene, the kingship and dominion is shared by the people of the Holy Ones of the Most High, and this kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. All dominion shall serve and obey them. All right. How are we to understand this, this that we've just read and heard a little bit more about? Well, first we know that God is the ultimate king and he gives his dominion, as I told the children, to his son. And Jesus says that in scripture. He says, God, all, the Father has given to me all that I've got authority over heaven and earth. Jesus shares the kingdom work and reign with his disciples, the apostles, and then the holy ones. That'd be all of you. Those that come after, the ones that come after because of the word they hear, they believe too. And they take their part 
in, in the good news of the kingdom and are become people of the kingdom. This is how Jesus reigns in and with his brothers and sisters, the body of Christ, the people of God in the everlasting kingdom. This is a beautiful ending, but how do we get from here to there? Daniel left us a clue, which I am lifting up today. Remember how in the last chapter, Daniel prayed three times a day, despite the fact that he was going to, you know, threaten to become lion's prey? Jesus tells us also to pray always and not lose hope. So I've been thinking about that because I think that chapter was put before this one on purpose. I think when we find ourselves up against a beast who may or may not be a king, but this beast wants or thinks it has dominion over us, the Apostle Paul and Daniel are offering us prayer. The Apostle Paul goes a little bit further in prayer, and he, he says the only way to do battle with beasts, which may or may not be flesh or blood, flesh and blood, but may be strongholds or snake-like creatures or forces that seek dominion over us, is to, you, is to take on the armor of God. That's the only way we will defeat them. Now, I find the armor of God interesting because we think of it as just armor, but really it's, it's a method of prayer. The armor of God is all about prayer. And Daniel shows us who has real dominion over death, life, and all of the realms. He says it's Jesus. So when we are called to pray by Jesus, who is one that invites us to pray, then we may find ourselves up against things that we can't see, but yet we are to be praying about, to be praying against even. Like, things not unlike what was Daniel's vision, things that seem horrible to us. So to be able to withstand and defeat beasts, we need to utilize the armor daily, not just once a week. <laughs> This will not work if this is the only time you put on the armor of God. I just will tell you for sure. I've had plenty of practice, and it doesn't work if we only use it on Sunday mornings. So, every day. So how do we get ready? Paul says to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power so that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The only power we have and that is to be empowered through is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We are to stand. That happens again and again in these verses, which means we don't run away. We stand because we may need to stand up for others who aren't able to stand. Sometimes we stand in place of them or with them, but we can't and don't stand alone. That one is hard for me because maybe you are like that too. Sometimes I think I'm strong or strong enough and they think then I'm at my strongest, but I'm not. You and I actually are at our strongest when we're weak because that's when we depend on the Lord. Paul is saying we have no idea what we're up against. Daniel was certainly troubled even when that dream was over because what he seemed, those beasts seem almost too mighty for him to deal with. I think Paul must have been reading Daniel. I'm convinced. That's where he came up with this armor of God. So let us remember whose image we bear and who has all the power and dominion. That's who we depend on. So let's take up the armor of God. Don't pick and choose which parts you like best. You have to have the whole armor. Daniel wanted to know the truth, and Jesus said he is the truth. So we need the truth around us. That's the belt of truth. It holds us together. The breastplate of righteousness over our heart. Remember, Daniel said he was blameless. And that's the reason the lions didn't chomp into them. And we've learned we're blameless through Jesus. So that's Jesus' righteousness that covers our heart. That's that, um, that's that breastplate of righteousness is Jesus. The shoes. What shoes are you wearing today? They need to be shoes that help us to stand and prepare and to proclaim, I'll get it out, to proclaim the gospel of peace. Wait, the gospel of peace? I thought we were in a battle. 
We are. But our proclamation is not war, but peace. True peace is found in whom? Jesus. God. Yes. So remember, Jesus stood and he told the storm to be calm. He spoke peace over that storm. He can speak peace over your storm too. Oh, and we must proclaim, oh, take up the shield of faith to hold out in front of us. So you have your breastplate, but you're also going to have this shield. Now, what is your shield of faith? Well, that's what we believe. That's our faith we have in Jesus. And only as we proclaim and hold our shield of faith out, that's what, gets, that's what takes out those fires, those fiery arrows that are being sent by the evil one. Now, put on your helmet of salvation. Where is Fred and, and um, yeah, Cheryl today? They always wear hats. We don't wear our hats anymore to worship, but that's a good reminder to put on the helmet of salvation. That's your hat. And it keeps your head calm, your mind calm, and protects your thoughts. And next, you take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Holy Spirit can help us understand and remember Scripture. But first, we have to read it. So once you've been reading your scripture, the Holy Spirit can help you remember it, and that's the sword of the Spirit. We cannot meet the beast with our own words nor in our own strength. Only the word of God planted in our hearts and minds will help us in our time, times of attack. Attacks, you see, it won't be just once, and they can come from all sides. It can be from our world. It could be from your own family. Could be in a store someplace at church. Could be our friends, strangers, different circumstances we encounter, even in ourselves. Yes. How will we share the gospel of peace in each of these situations and stay standing? Daniel and Paul agree, pray in the spirit with the armor in all times. Keep alert. Continue to pray for all the saints. Those are the people around you. Take a good look at them. That's who you'll be praying for this week. And all of the saints in our community and all over the world, those that are Christ followers. We are to be Christ's representative in prayer as we spread the gospel of peace. Even to those who aren't peaceful. Even to those who mean us harm. As we pray in Jesus, we receive Jesus and his humble, everlasting dominion of peace. I think we need to put on the armor of God right now as we go to God and Christ in prayer. Glorious God, we don't like nightmares very much. And so this, this chapter of Daniel is, is a little too out there. It's very unusual. Lots of symbolism. Lots of things we don't understand. And we aren't given names and faces to say who is who. We like to have things simple, Lord God. But maybe this chapter in Daniel reminds us that the things in the heavenlies, the, that which is greater than what we can see, is difficult to explain. Difficult even to show to a very strong and believing Hebrew like Daniel. So Lord, there are things I guess we confess today that we don't know, that we don't understand about our world and about the spiritual world and realm of which you have set Jesus to be Lord of heaven and earth. And then you've invited us to, to say yes to him, as I encourage the children today, to let, to let him have dominion over us, even over our prayers, even over our calendar, even over our work, our play, our days off, our days on, and even over this church. Indeed. We invite you to have dominion, Lord Jesus, over this church so that we might be your people and we might carry you 
wrapped around us the truth that helps us sort out the things that come towards us, what's real, what's not. The Jew would help us to confess our sin to you so that we won't be surprised what's in that book of life, that book one day that has all, everything written in it because we've already confessed it to you. You know it and we know it. And Lord, thank you for your blood that covers us, that makes us blameless in God's sight because of you, Lord Jesus. And thank you that you give us a helmet to put on that's our salvation that comes from you. For that cross that you endured is what became our salvation. Where it looked like you were dead, you were alive three days later. And you indeed have eternal dominion over us and over our world. Let us never give up hope, but keep our, get our, our faith strong so that we hold our shield of faith inside of ourselves. Others may not see it, but it's there. And Lord, that our feet might always have something on them that helps us remember how to stand in peace with whatever we are facing. Your peace, Jesus. The peace that tells the fiery storms to cease in your name. And Lord, you give us a sword that is actually your word, that is what your spirit whispers to us in those moments where we think we have nothing that we could possibly say. It offers us to proclaim the good news that Jesus is Lord and none other. And he has come to bring peace to all parts and all persons in all places where people rule all the way across our world. Thank you, Lord. We invite you this day to have dominion and to bring your peace into Jeff Stambaugh, Megan's dad. Lord, we lift up and bless you for your grace that, that is already there surrounding him and, and bringing your wondrous healing grace into Jeff, into that tumor, into those blood clots, Lord. We thank you. Thank you that we can take part in, in speaking your truth of your dominion over him. Lord, we lift up families that are in crisis. Uh, so many things that tear our families apart these days, Lord. We lift up families, and especially of families that are dealing with mental illness. We lift them to you today for your grace. For your grace is plentiful for all kinds of illness, whether it is a body part of us that we can see or, or the mind that's harder to see. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for bringing your peacefulness into those situations too. Lord, we lift up Amanda who has found out she has a breast cancer diagnosis and we lift Amanda to you today and she's not, she's young in her 30s, I believe. And Lord, we know that's devastating, but we know you have complete dominion over this earth. So we, we God, invite your grace and mercy. We know it's already there, so we pray for more. We pray that she would know that she is covered in your grace and our prayers, and that she would take comfort and gain strength and healing through that and knowing that. Lord, we lift up everyone, those that are on our list that are in cancer treatment or are finishing cancer treatment or beginning cancer treatment. And Lord God, we bless you for the grace that flows from heaven over each of these people. We know that your grace is more powerful than anything on this earth for your wondrous power and grace raised Jesus from that tomb. So Lord, we believe for that grace on each of those on our list this day. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you that Buck made it to worship this morning, even though his knee gives him fits. We bless you for grace over his knee. We bless you this morning. We thank you that Bruce is with us, and we bless you for your grace over him 
He was even here for the work day. We bless you, Lord. We thank you. We pray this in your marvelous and powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Our offering is still being um, placed in the bins in the back, our offering plates in the back. And so we praise God for the gifts given that we can share. Let's sing. We say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Let us remain standing if you're able and um, sing in the singing. seated. Let us now join together in the feast of the people of God. I invite you now to open your bags and open your bottles and fill your cups if you haven't done so already. This table is open to all who trust in Jesus, all who call upon his name, the good shepherd of the sheep. 
He is the one who invites you here. This is his table. Let us pray. God and creator of our world, we are grateful this day that we are your creation and that we can come to you when we thirst. We can come to you when we're hungry. We can come to you empty-handed. Thank you for your promise to fill us, feed us, and give us everything we need in your Son, Jesus. For he is the bread of life. He is the living water. He is all we need. We bless you for sending him our shepherd Jesus who came after us and calls to us to follow him. We bless you for sending the shepherd Jesus who reminded us that in him we are forgiven when we turn over all of our past, our sin, our hurts, that he brings healing. We bless you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who enlivens our hearts and our lives and even enlivens this supper that we share together and who reminds us whose we are and allows us to hear your voice speaking when we read scripture and that you answer when we call so that we can be your people. We bless you this day, Father, for the gift of bread and for juice that we have before us, for they ultimately come from you. We bless those who made them and for the, all the gifts you give us. May we not take them for granted. We bless you that as we take this food and drink into ourselves, we are taking you, Lord Jesus, into ourselves so that you would make us more like you in all that we do and say. We bless you for the work you give us to do in prayer as you lead us on the right paths where you go. May be, we be aware of your purpose and your plan, your dominion over the moments of our days. We pray all of this for and with Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That night when Jesus shared, he was sitting with shared his disciples around a Passover meal. And this was his last meal, but they weren't really sure of that at the time, but we know that now. And as he took the bread from the table, he blessed God like we have. And then he said, this is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Then Jesus took the cup from the table and he blessed God for this cup of wine that they would have had. And he said, this is a new covenant in my blood for the remission, for the forgiveness, for the obliterating all the sins there ever was. You're to do this every time, he said, that you drink of this. You're to remember him. Take the cup of salvation. For every time we drink this cup and we eat this bread, we tell the story. We tell the story of Jesus and how he defeated death and how his kingdom and his dominion is forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, this is a mighty meal. 
There's a whole lot more going on here than simple drink and simple food. This meal demonstrates what Scripture says, that, that you have conquered death and your ultimate, ultimate kingdom is yours. There is no other. And God, we praise you for that this day. In the midst of this world, many kingdoms, it is good, it is wonderful to know that Jesus reigns over the kingdom of God, which we are a part. We bless you and praise your name. Amen. Would you stand as you are able and we sing our closing hymn, My Life Flows On. at the door because we are headed down to the hall so this will be your benediction but I won't say the, the blessing until we get down there how's that will that work I invite you all to remember that no matter what nightmare assails you this week no matter what beast you have to encounter Lord Jesus is greater than all put on that armor and let's stand in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen Go in peace.